Ladies and gentlemen, well, welcome to Room for Discussion. Um, my name is Enze and next to me is sitting Thijs. Uh, today we have the honor to host a very interesting interview with uh, the, one of the leading uh, global economists, Professor Asimoglu. Uh, he is the co-author of Why Nations Fail, uh, where he touches upon uh, society's part of development uh, via institutional changes and also uh, tries to connect uh, the state and society. Uh, together with him, we will discuss uh, China's institutional path and uh, its uh, institutions also. But we also will discuss the EU and if it's better off beca in becoming a federation. Uh, so please join us to find out. And uh, Professor Osmoglu, thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, uh, Ramsey. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, your work has certainly left its, its marks. And if we uh, uh, have a look at some eye-catching uh, Wikipedia facts, then uh, yeah, we see that you ranked third in the list of favorite living economists under 60. Uh, you are the third most frequently cited author in the university syllabi. And uh, between 2005 and 2015, you were the most frequently cited economist in general. So why do you think your uh, theories are resonating so well in, in the general public? Well, that I don't, I don't, I think it's, uh, that's not for me to answer. I think other people <laughs> will have to provide a more objective take on that. Uh, but I think one reason for uh, uh, the interest in some of these topics is just because the topics are important. So uh, I think every science, grapples with the dilemma that social sciences and economics in particular have been dealing with over the last several decades, you know, uh, narrow down uh, and look at very specific questions that are somewhat easier to answer and tackle the sort of the big questions that were foundational for that science. And which and, questions do you mean exactly? And I think what I have, in some sense, done is uh, try to go back to some of those foundational questions, even when they are difficult to answer. So then we're not going to have perfect solutions for them, but still, I think uh, bringing the tools and the reasoning and all the accumulated knowledge of social sciences uh, to bear on them is, is, is useful. All right. I mean, one of the most significant contributions that you made to economic theory is, of course, your institutional theory. Um, perhaps your most influential work, Renz already mentioned it, is Why Nations Fail, uh, which explains the economic, economic disparities between different nations, between different states. What is the most important reason why nations fail? So, uh, why nations fail itself is uh, the outcome of almost the two-decade collaboration between myself and James Robinson. And it was very much conceived along the lines of what I just mentioned, which is to go back to some of the bigger questions that motivated classic economists, what determined the economic and social success of some nations while others don't perform at the same level. So to us, failure is really failure to take advantage of all of the opportunities. Of course, when you look at the world, there are some countries that are really failing, you know, uh, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, that are, you know, under the uh, influence of gangs or uh, the Syria or Iraq, where, you know, state institutions have not been able to form and low level or high level civil war is continuing uh, and economic failures everywhere, especially during COVID, uh, but 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 I think also uh, it is a failure when a uh, when countries like Latin American ones stopped growing for 20 25 years after 19 uh, after the late 1970s. So for that, James Robinson and I sort of bring a uh, framework that's built both on politics and economics. Economics is critical because we're asking economic questions, and there are certain basic tenets of economic thought that are quite critical. Incentives, opportunities, innovation, technology, productivity. In fact, in some level, uh, there are many parts of the economic 
corpus that need to be extended for the modern world, but some basic aspects that if you provide people opportunities, uh, they have incentives, and they can enter into different occupations, into different businesses, that's going to generate a lot of economic dynamism. I think that's correct. But what's missing, and that's what's central for our approach, is that those things cannot be understood independently of politics. So who has political power? How the voice, participation, uh, connections of different actors are shaped and structured. All of these are central for understanding both economic performance and failure. So that's how we approach the problem, or put differently, we look at the ensemble of economic and political institutions, whether economic institutions are inclusive, they encourage these sort of incentives and opportunities, but then also note that inclusive economic institutions are very difficult to maintain if you don't have inclusive political institutions which we define as political institutions that distribute political power equally. So the alternative to inclusive economic institutions is what we call extractive economic institutions because a small group of people or some group of people monopolize all the assets, all the opportunities, and exclude, exploit, extract from the rest. Politically, the equivalent of that is when a small group of people monopolize all political power. And it is their wishes, their views, their uh, uh, approaches that matter for political collective decisions in society. And what exactly influences whether a country has includes for restrictive political institutions? What influences whether um, power is indeed dominated by a small elite? That's a, a critical question. And in fact, it's a question that really takes up more than a book uh, because it's also the topic of our follow-up book, which we published a year and a half ago, The Narrow Corridor, almost two years ago now, time flies by. Uh, but we start by uh, <clears throat> sort of dismissing some of the simplistic theories or what we view as simplistic theories, that geographic factors, for example, either directly determine economic prosperity or directly determine whether you have inclusive or extractive institutions or culture. So you know, one might say, uh, you know, that culture matters. Of course, there are aspects of culture mattering, but we do not uh, uh, accept that there are some unchanging national cultures that determine whether you are rich or not. But even more importantly, cultural theories are often used by arguing, you know, Islam cannot be democratic. You know, the, uh, uh, the Judeo-Christian values were very important for freedom and democracy in Europe. And again, we think these are simplistic. Uh, they are obviously important that there are certain ideas that are critical for institutions to function. If we stop believing that we are all a community, we are citizens, and the government has to be responsible to us, that would change political institutions in any country in Europe or in the United States. But there isn't sort of this uh, simple deterministic link between certain simple cultural characteristics and, and, and inclusive or extractive institutions. So, so what matters then? Well, two things. You know, history matters. Historical accidents, uh, historical successes and failures are going to matter. But second, a lot of it is actually uh, individuals getting together in groups, solving collective action problems, structuring organizations and institutions in order to build better institutions. So in some sense, it's both optimistic and pessimistic. Mm -hmm. History matters. And if you are in the midst of a highly extractive society, it's going to be very difficult to get out of it. But it's also optimistic that at the end of the day, institutions are things that we make and remake every day. Yeah, so then, we can change institutions. And we have seen in history many examples of societies that transition from extractive to inclusive. Yeah, what, what, and then the, the, uh, yeah, you mentioned the, the follow-up was the narrow corridor, but what is the, the most key uh, insight that your, the narrow cor corridor brings to the table in comparison with um, the Why Nations Fail? Well, I think uh, the key insight in some sense, uh, there are several that are linked, but if I were to summarize it in one sentence, we delve much deeper into the dynamics of how these and the key thing there that we emphasize that's novel relative to why nations fail and novel to, I think, relative to much of the social science work is the balance between state and society. State and elites 
are always very powerful uh, in modern society, but they're not uh, they're not boundlessly powerful. Uh, in and fact, what do you mean are, by that? If, if I'm, if I'm meaning that you know, they're what they can do, how they can influence society, how they can regulate society has limits. And in fact, a lot of the political scientists who thought about origins of the state uh, sort of emphasize, well, you know, the modern state emerges when a charismatic leader or a powerful group of strong state institutions are able to impose their will on society. Uh, so the classic case would be, for example, in the UK or in England, uh, well, before it was the UK, uh, you cannot understand the modern state without the Tudor period state building under uh, monarchs like Henry the Seventh or Henry the Eighth. So we take a somewhat different view. We think that balance between society, which we uh, define as all non-elite individuals and their ability to come together via traditions, norms, collective action, as well as institutionalized means is critical and a balance between state and society is much more important. So if you do not have that balance, you are going to have repressive state institutions, but they're not going to evolve in a direction that continuously pushes them and makes them adapt to changing circumstances. Right. If, okay. On the other hand, state institutions are not sufficiently strong, then you're not going to have all of the benefits of a law-based society. But in that narrow corridor, when there is that balance, a very different type of dynamic emerges. A country that certainly does not meet this, re this requirement of, of having this balance in, um, in the narrow corridor is China, of course, a country with very extractive institutions, political institutions. Um, now, you argue that China's economic growth will never be sustainable. So there will e either be a situation in which China uh, will make its political institutions more inclusive, or the economic growth from China is just going to stagnate at some point. Why are these the only two possibilities? Well, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying with certainty that those are, of course, the only two possibilities for the next 10 years or 20 years. It's more a long-term tendency. And in fact, the way that you've put it is the, uh, the articulation that we provided in the in, in why nations fail. In narrow corridor, I think it's a little slightly more subtle in that we wouldn't say after we've thought through and worked through the narrow corridor that either China is going to stop growing or it will become inclusive. In fact, the sort of the dynamic aspect of the theory of narrow corridor says that once a society has been in uh, so weakened relative to the state as in China, which has you know, been a historical process you know, over 2000 years, and especially over the last several decades, then it's going to be very difficult to move back into the corridor. So I don't think we're going to see China become uh, democratic or have very active political participation by citizens anytime soon. So uh, then the question becomes, does that mean that going back to the dichotomy that you just provided, we expect China to stagnate? Not to stagnate in any time soon, but I believe, and we already see that, the economic growth in China is going to become more and more strained. It's going to be associated with more and more self-contradictions, with more and more inefficiencies. It's going to require more and more interventions in order to uh, sort of keep on going. And I think we are going to see that uh, not immediately, but in the next two decades or so. Uh, you know, but there are alternatives. Look, I mean, I'm not denying that any theory is imperfect. There, there are things that we don't take into account. So here is one scenario which I don't believe, I don't think it's likely, but I'm just in the, in the interest of showing the whole spectrum of ways of thinking about it. Uh, you know, AI perhaps might change things. Perhaps it is the case, where some people believe, I don't, that uh, AI require, has a, 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 a complete hunger for data. So the more data you have, 
the much more efficient AI is going to become. And we are at the cusp of AI revolutionizing many, many technologies. So it could then be that the, 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 the despotic Chinese system, which collects the data of you know, uh, more than a half billion and a half people mm -hmm. without any privacy concerns and uses them in ways that would be unacceptable in many other countries in the world, is going to have an advantage in AI. Yeah, so yeah, I don't yeah. believe any of these three mm -hmm. Uh, premises are very likely, but there are ways of thinking about how Chinese growth is going to go in yeah. the next several decades and that is different than saying, oh, China is immediately going to stop having sustained growth. And if, if we move a little bit further in the, in the EI, what you just uh, mentioned, is, is uh, at this moment, the, China has the, the social credit, uh, credit system that you also mentioned right. in the narrow corridor. It's, it's uh, for the audience when a citizen is uh, uh, walking through red light or, or something like that, then he doesn't get any social credits and he cannot uh, travel abroad, for example. So uh, what do you think that uh, these surveillance will have, what kind of um, influence it will have on, on the development of the Chinese institutions? Well, look, I mean, the effects on Chinese institutions are very clear. They're going to go in the same direction that they have done, especially under Xi Jinping which is that civil society is going to become weaker and weaker. And this is where actually culture becomes relevant. You know, we also have to think about how all of this repression makes people think about state society relations, how they belong, what they are entitled to do and what they're not. I think, uh, you know, if you look at the Tiananmen Square generation, you know, the youth that were university students, uh, high school students, university students, in the sort of opening that was created after you know, the failure of cultural revolution, where even though it was a hugely repressive system, new ideas started coming in, state institutions uh, of the Communist Party were not strong enough to maintain sort of uh, uh, the role of thought police. You know, there was a hunger in that generation uh, for freedom, for self-expression, for take me charting their own course, you know, look at the biographies of, of some of the people in that, you know, who were leaders of the Tiananmen Square, some of them die, some of them uh, survive. Uh, you know, it's just inspiring. It's very mm -hmm. difficult to see that today. People are indoctrinated, uh, media, school, social interaction, uh, make it much harder for people to develop the same kind of hunger for uh, political participation, political self-expression. Mm -hmm. So what that means, I think, is that especially with Xi Jinping's presidency, we're going to go more and more in that direction with things like social credit system, more of the internet censored now, censorship now powered with AI. And, uh, and, and, and the question is, again, we don't know for sure, but my conjecture would be, that's not just going to be political, it's also going to be economic. At some point, when people really Sort of take on that role of being subservient, being uh, afraid of state institutions because you know state institutions are so dominant, civil society is so impaired. That's going to start affecting their economic decisions. That's going to start. I mean, it's already affecting their economic decisions, but it's going to start affecting their creativity, their experimentation. So I think there are a variety of changes that we have to watch out in China. But I want to also say one sentence that uh, that's very important to me, which is that. You know, when I emphasize that <clears throat> 2,000 years of despotic rule in China makes it very difficult to build uh, you know, democratic institutions or institutions for political participation, I do not mean by any stretch that there is some Chinese culture that's inimical to democracy. That's another idea that some political scientists like Samuel Huntington and others have expressed, and many political, uh, many political figures like Harry Kissinger. Harry Kissinger. But, uh, but it's actually quite far from the truth. If you look at the precepts and attributes of Chinese culture, they are quite consistent with very different ways of structuring the political system. And you see that in Taiwan, cut from the same cultural cloth with the same or even stronger Confucian elements in school teaching, in families, etc. Taiwan has built an amazingly vibrant democracy in just a short three decades. So, uh, so, so there is nothing cultural in this, but it is a difficult process of getting from where we are to the narrow corridor, even if it was allowed to happen. 
But don't you think that this is uh, all the, almost the only way uh, to control 1.3 billion people? Just uh, such an uh, such a system like we see in China. Well, I don't know. Um, I think the evidence that low education societies have to be governed despotically doesn't hold up very well. Our own econometric work and our own historical work shows that democracy is good for economic growth, for distribution, for health, for education, regardless of the level of development. Perhaps there are some interactions. It might well be that democracy functions a little bit better if you have more highly educated people because they can be slightly more politically active, but it doesn't seem to be an effect that you know, reverses things. Uh, now, you've put it slightly differently. You didn't say... China is still not the same level of education and economic development as Europe, but you said a large country. Now, I don't think size matters all that much either. But you're right that if you want to run a very, very, very large country in a centralized manner, that might be some problem. But you know, when we talk of democracy or society participation, I have never seen that happen just at the national level as well. It's always you know, local, municipal, regional participation, as well as national participation. So yes, I, I suspect that if China experimented with different models of building democracy, building a new political system, probably something that has a more decentralized nature than its current system would be the one that, that emerges. Uh, and then the question of whether you really have to govern 1.5 billion people, uh, you know, uh, 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 despotically and no, no other way would become moot. All right. Um, in your work, you also talk about critical junctures as potential ways uh, to create institutional change. And in the Chinese example, you of course mentioned uh, the, the case where Mao died in the 70s, uh, because after that, China's economic institutions became much more inclusive. Uh, there was like an actual capitalist system with a market system, even though it was political capitalism, but it was capitalism. Do you think that COVID could also be a critical juncture um, in the Chinese case? Yes, absolutely. I think there is no doubt in my mind that COVID is has created a critical juncture for the world. In but I sense? think much less for China. Oh, really? And I think, yes, I think for the very simple reason that, look, if you look at COVID, it's of course been an amazingly costly year and a half with millions of people who lost their lives globally, completely uh, unnecessarily at some level, because we could have done much better globally. But in the scheme of things, it isn't as large a shock as the Great Depression, World War I, or World War II. So I see COVID mostly as an accelerator of two things. It shows the inefficiencies, the uh, non, non unsustainability of certain economic systems, including the one in the US, which has led to so much inequality. And it has shown the ineptitude of the leading ruling political class in many countries. I think that's the way in which it has created a critical juncture for places like the US, perhaps European Union, although much less so perhaps. But for China, look, China has been actually quite successful during COVID. They were <clears throat> together with Taiwan and South Korea uh, and New Zealand, you know, some of the few countries that were able to contain COVID before the vaccine, what we call vaccines arrive. Now there are certain other aspects and, and economically, I think they've managed it quite well with the right amount of spending uh, so that the economy is completely slumped. Now there are many other problems that China uh, experienced during this period, including at the out <coughs> onset of the crisis when there was uh, uh, institutional transparency and as a result, uh, the world did not react to the pandemic 
in time. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that uh, vaccines uh, have been not very well done. And, uh, and, and also you see the transparency problem. There was a lot of misinformation about the vaccines for the, uh, the early st stages of the Chinese vaccine. Mm -hmm. But but for the Chinese people, I think the most tangible results are actually pretty good, both national and local government responses. Will it create? So in that a sense, new... I don't think oh, that sorry. China is going to, uh, to 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 view this as a, or it's going to happen as a critical juncture that will change the direction of the country. Yet. Right. So COVID has influenced, uh, well, not the institution per se, but at least the economic situation of China quite well, quite positively, whereas for the United States, for instance, uh, it's much more negative. Do you think that COVID then at least could create, could have created a new great divergence in which China has taken the lead? I think that remains to be seen. Uh, that would have been my guess or my forecast if Trump had remained in power because uh, <clears throat> the amount of erosion of institutions quality of civil service, the international cooperation that U.S. was at least contributing or not blocking, uh, all of these things, you know, happened very fast under Trump in a very negative direction. But some of that wasn't very deep, meaning that the changes weren't so deep that they were not reversible. And you're seeing the Biden administration. I mean, I think I'm very positive about what the Biden administration is doing. But if you think about it, it's not very radical what they're doing. They're just going back to normal in many things. But it seems like such a refreshing change of direction. And also, you see how quickly it's restructuring and reconstructing things like uh, international cooperation, the Paris Agreement, uh, fiscal coordination between Europe and the US. These are not like revolutionary ideas. They were... Uh, Practice for several decades after World War II, so uh, so 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 I think it's uh, it's premature to say that you know China has accelerated and U.S. is falling behind. I think uh, actually U.S. is going to have a very rapid recovery, and if there are other good policies adopted by the current administration, I think it can change the direction of U.S. economic growth in a positive way. Interesting. Yeah, something else that makes uh, China unique is its uh, geopolitical dominance uh, with the help of uh, big infrastructure projects in African countries, but also weaker parts of, of Europe. Uh, and, and this is more and more causing uh, a huge power imbalance that makes uh, these weaker countries more dependent on, on China. Um, and should we be afraid that these uh, uh, China's extractive Institutions have a spillover effect in the um, weaker parts of the world. Absolutely, yes. I think that's a real concern. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, let me be quite open that this is not nothing different. Even countries that have broadly inclusive institutions do that. The U.S., for example, has used its uh, you know huge political hegemonic power in Latin America and sometimes in other parts of the world, and often with negative consequences, sometimes with positive consequences, but uh, sometimes with negative consequences. The Monroe Doctrine is no different than China claiming, you know, hegemony in the South China Sea, mm -hmm. in some sense. And, uh, and, and, you know, U.S. has always had problems. You know, it's neither a fully inclusive country, but obviously it's, I wouldn't say it's an extractive country as well. It's been, it's been, been a troubled but still relatively democratic and open society. But when it when you look at its impact on Latin America, you know, for most of the 20th century, it's been quite negative. So I don't find it surprising that China is playing an exploitative role in in that region. Uh, but you know what really is different about China's case from the U.S. is because. China is really trying to export a system mm -hmm. that is going to be inimical to the and, further and, political. And does world. that situation worry you that they want to uh, imply a particular system? It worries me, but it's also not clear what you can do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we cannot do uh, do anything about it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think if there was broad international cooperation among all other countries, 
perhaps more pressure could be put on China. And I think that's one of the things that Biden is trying to do. But I think at the end of the day, it's going to be very difficult. And for the reasons that you already hinted at, which is, you know, the Chinese market is so important, Chinese input supplies are so important that individual European countries, whatever the European Union says, are going to be willing to cut deals with China. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, let's move on to the second topic that we will discuss today is, is the European Union. And um, yeah, that, that's uh, quite interesting because uh, we have barely seen you draw attention to the EU in your, in your work. Uh, but the EU is, of course, um, not a state, uh, a sovereign state, but it, uh, it, because of the political power is still at the nation level. Uh, but it's, it definitely has some state-like elements. So how would you apply your theory um, of institutional or st institutionalism on the EU in a, in a nutshell? Well, uh, let me first uh, uh, explain why I don't, uh, I mean, I, I've written a few things on the, e, on, on, on the European Union, but it's not in any of the books but for a very simple reason. It's a shortcoming of the framework that Jim and I have developed uh, very self-consciously. They are national theories. Uh, for most of history, international factors have mattered quite a lot as well, but we wanted to focus on the national dynamics and bringing in the international dynamics was going to make the books even longer. That's a shortcoming. Uh, a full framework uh, would definitely have to take those international factors much more organically into, into account. So we can see another and, book of you and uh, about the EU, I guess. Yes, that's exactly the, the thing, which is that EU is has to be viewed as a supranational institution. Mm -hmm. you know, in a in a you know this is uh, you know this is not the way that EU developed from day to day. But the grand vision, I think, is that in a world in which many economic transactions and many social relations are not national, they are within Europe between citizens of different countries, you need institutions that are beyond the national level. And I think the early founders or the leaders of the European Union or the Steel and Coal Commission saw that that's important not just for economic growth in the European area, but also for peace, stability, defense against Soviet Russia, and so on. So European Union from the beginning, therefore, was a way of creating supranational institutions. But the problem is, those are very difficult to create. As I said, politics is local most of the time. It has a municipal local dimension. It sometimes can get projected in a healthy way to the national, but it becomes harder and harder when you go to a higher level, the supranational level. And I think those are the pains that European Union has continuously felt. When you go to the supranational level, people feel more alienated, more distant to the government. Keeping bureaucrats accountable is harder. Communication is harder in such a heterogeneous area. Uh, turning those bureaucrats, even when they are doing good things, into boogeymen is harder. You're going to have more veto players blocking things. And all of those problems are not going to go away. I think the European Union is going to experience them day in and day out. On the other hand, I think we are all, as a world, very, very, very lucky that European Union is doing that because it's an experiment. Look, if I look at WHO, United Nations, even World Bank, as other models of supranational institutions, I would say EU beats them hands down. It's much, much better than all of them. So we're learning a lot from the EU about what to do and also a lot about a lot of the mistakes. And I also think that the European Union or European state system in general, society states, are potentially a very good counterweight both to China and the US. There are many things wrong with the way that Chinese and the US economies are going. And I think the European Union also has a lot of problems, but on some important things like the role of big tech, privacy, democracy, human rights, I think it's a better counterweight uh, and on climate is a much, much better counterweight. So, yeah. so I think uh, we have to cherish the European Union, but on the other hand, that doesn't mean that it, it doesn't have fundamental problems. So, I mean, a few of the fundamental problems you already mentioned, of course, the fact that people feel alienated to such a supranational institution. Uh, but at the same time, 
it's also difficult to say that the EU would be efficient enough and democratic enough. Uh, one of the solutions that has been offered by some is that the EU should become a federation, so a sovereign state in itself. But I hear you mentioning right now that it is important enough to have supranational institutions, right? So would you? Yeah, be and also I think you know. Uh, look, it's very difficult for me to say to answer this question. Why? Because the European Union, starting from the uh, Coal and Steel Commission, and Coal Commission, has a number of time overstepped, meaning gone faster than its people would want. And sometimes it has been a fairly successful project, like at the early stages of the founding of the EU. And sometimes it's been disaster with the single currency. So I think single currency was a mistake in hindsight. I, at the time, I wouldn't have said it was a mistake. I wouldn't mm -hmm. be a bit cautious, but in hindsight, I think it was a mistake. A mistake in general or a mistake that... Well, it was just too soon. Yeah, okay. And the financial crisis and all that happened to Greece, Portugal, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, I think are quite related to the single currency. So, so I don't know when, you know, bureaucrats or European youth leaders or European political leaders push the next stage of unification too soon. What would happen? I don't know. I'd, I think if you were to take a poll among all EU member citizens, there would be an overwhelming majority against mm. the Federation. An unnecessary risk. So, so that means that you are going against the citizens' wishes. And again, <clears throat> leaders sometimes can do that, but should do it very seldomly and only when those are not very, very broadly held views. So, so it's a difficult dance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. And within the EU, we also see uh, different uh, and some interesting, unexpected differences. Uh, take, for example, Latvia, uh, Estonia, and Lithuania. Uh, each started as a poor Soviet uh, state, yet Estonia has, has developed far ahead of other Baltic states. Um, and then there's the question: Why can some countries that that have uh, similar uh, part dependency? Such different uh, institutions. I I don't know the answer to that. I think you know, <clears throat> I suspect it's because of the policies, not economic policies, but I mean partly economic policies, but not just economic policies. The whole sort of economic, social, and political policies that have changed the integration path. But we know that this is a very very treacherous process. You know the the, the as you know better than I do, the a prime example of economic success in Europe is Poland. Uh, it, it is, I think, still the fastest growing country in Europe uh, over the last 30 years. And, uh, and, and the level of integration, economic development, investment, modernization in Poland is far beyond anybody could have hoped for. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you're also seeing that Polish institutions have been at the brink of collapse under the Peace and Justice Party that is, you know, creating a particular version of authoritarian populism in Europe. Moving away from but the narrow corridor. Very difficult to understand. Right? Yeah. Sorry? Moving away from the narrow corridor. Right, moving yeah. away from the narrow corridor, uh, increasing its co command of the judiciary, silencing critics, uh, uh, muzzling civil society. Uh, you know, I think... <clears throat> I think it shows how difficult this transition is, and uh, and 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 you know I think that's another area where people can say European Union overstepped, and the jury is out whether it was success or not. The European Union initially was for a relatively small group of countries, and even the entry of Britain, Greece, Turkey were quite contentious matters. They weren't part of the original club that, you know, uh, would they fit, Will they are they welcome, et cetera. Well, Britain didn't want to be part of the original club. Uh, <clears throat> but then when it came time to think about Eastern Europe, European leaders saw that as an opportunity both to enlarge EU and sort of reduce the sphere of influence of 
Soviet or Russia, not Soviet Russia was about, was about to, to disappear by that by that point. And it very quickly uh, allowed the accession of many of these countries, including uh, later the Baltic Republic. And I think at some level that was a success. These countries grew quite well on the whole. Uh, they did not go back to communism, even when there is this threat against uh, democracy that we're talking about, it's not coming back to some sort of retrograde uh, communist regime. That's what people were afraid of at the time. But on the other hand, it has increased both the political, economic, structural, cultural heterogeneity of the European Union. And again, how to deal with that uh, is, 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 is a challenge. It becomes a challenge, for example, dealing with the migrant crisis. You know, Hungary and Poland pull in a very different direction than the rest of Europe. Uh, and, and I think some of those strains are at the root of the political backlash that's fueling people like uh, the Fidesz party in uh, <clears throat> In, in, in Hungary or the Peace and Justice Party in Poland. Great. Mr. Asimoglu, we've uh, discussed a number of cases, of course, China, European Union, and some states within the EU. As a final question, quite a number of students that are watching right now are from countries with extractive political and economic institutions. What would your advice for them be? How can they effectuate individual change? Well, I think that's a very difficult question. I don't know, you know, you can't say to people, oh yeah, go and uh, <clears throat> try to undermine your extractive regime. That may not be the right uh, action. It may be individually dangerous. But I think the most important thing is don't become apolitical. I think the, I've seen that in Turkey, for example, where I was growing up under a dictatorship. <clears throat> the reaction of many people would be to withdraw completely from politics mm -hmm. and lose interest. You may or may not want to be politically active in a movement, especially in, in, a, in a society that provides a lot of uh, dangerous pathways for people who are politically active, but do not become politically inactive. So always remain aware, understand the issues, and remain concerned, because if not today, tomorrow, there will be better ways of participating in politics. and the, the way that extractive institutions become most durable is when people withdraw from politics. So it becomes a completely uh, dominated by elites, soldiers, uh, corrupt politicians, and so on. So, so stay informed and create your own opinion. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Yes, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Mr. Asmodov, thank you very much for thank our you. audience. I mean, my pleasure. Thank you. Our pleasure as well, for sure. Uh, for our audience, next week we'll be having Olaf Schleip, who's the Executive Director of the Dutch Central Bank. And for now, I would like to wish you a great day, because the weather in the Netherlands right now is very good. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Smoke. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.